I want to begin again with my gratitude for your taking the time. Both of you are extraordinarily busy. I feel like I'm stepping into uh, the Museum of American Jewish Life. This is like really an incredible, an incredible place to be. And what I want to focus on in our conversation is the notion of professional divergence when a child chooses to chart their own path. And when we were talking before, I mentioned a word that you said, don't mention that word again. And I'm going to mention it again right at the outset. There are people, and we we mentioned there's a great article by Adam Furziger, who used the word dynasty to describe what you've built through KJ, through Ramaz. And you push back, say, I don't want to use the word dynasty. So I guess I wanted to begin by asking you, why don't you like the word dynasty? And then maybe we could talk a little bit about the first time that you realized that there were any expectations, maybe not dynastic expectations, but any expectations that you were going to go on a certain path to begin with. You have a couple of hours uh, to discuss (laughs) this. Uh, First of all, the word dynasty is very presumptuous. And I don't like presumptuous things. Um, my great grandfather, the Ramaz, Rav Moshe Zavulan Margolis, came to our congregation, Kehillah Jeshurun, KJ, in 1906 and served there as the rabbi, the senior rabbi, until 1936 when he passed away. My father came as his English-speaking assistant, Rabbi Joseph H. Lukstein, before he was actually even a rabbi. He didn't have smicha yet from YU. And he came as the English-speaking assistant. And in 1936, after my great-grandfather, well, first of all, my father married the the boss's granddaughter. (laughs) Rabbi Margolis' daughter's daughter, my mother, Gertrude uh, S. Luckstein. And uh, in 1936, after uh, my great-grandfather's passing on Zion Elul, um, my father became the rabbi of the congregation. And in 1958, when I received smicha from Yeshiva University, Rob Soloveitchik and Rob uh, Dr. Belkin, Aleha Mashalom. Uh, there were very few positions available. And so I came as my father's assistant. I'm just, just to pause, I'm just curious. W- would you have considered other pulpits at that point? Yes, I would have considered other pulpits. There, there, were, there were two possibilities. One was in Detroit, and I wasn't going to Detroit because I was 26 years old and not married, and I thought there were no Jewish girls in Detroit. <laughs> Interestingly, my son is married to a Jewish girl from Detroit, okay. Georgie. Thank God for her. But I wasn't, I wasn't going to go to Detroit. The other possibility was what became the Sephardic Temple sure. in Cedarhurst. It was going to be a new Sephardi congregation in a place where no Sephardim lived. They would all have to drive from Brooklyn or from Long Island. Now, I did not consider that it's my job to worry about how people get to shul. How they got to shul, got to shul. But to go to a place when nobody lived... And everybody had to drive. I I wasn't so comfortable with that. And besides which, I was an Ashkenazi, and I didn't yeah. uh, I didn't feel comfortable becoming it's so a remarkable Sparty. to think of the f- it's in the five towns to think of the five towns that way. That's right. It's that's, quite a different place now. That's I grew what up it in was. the five towns. So I yeah. in retrospect, I think how many smorgasbords I could have eaten <laughs> in the Sephardic temple over these years. I would probably be three times my size. Yeah. yeah. At least in girth. So I came here, and uh, it was an interesting uh, challenge um, to come and be uh, my father's assistant. My father was arguably the greatest modern Orthodox rabbi of his time. He was the teacher of everybody, 
and the model for so many uh, outstanding rabbis, Rabbi Lamb, Rabbi Roth, Rabbi Klapperman, Rabbi Izzy Miller, these were all his students. And I'm coming in as his assistant. It probably awakened in me uh, some of the doubts that I had subconsciously, I think, when I grew up. As I was growing up, I never expected to be a rabbi. Really? Never. I didn't know what I wanted to be. People thought I would be a lawyer because I had the gift of gab. Sure. And they thought, oh, well, he'll be a litigator or something like that. I never really thought of being a, a lawyer. And I actually went to Columbia College. And uh, when uh, uh, I was in the end of my junior year, uh, I suddenly realized that I was going to be graduated from Columbia College in another year and a quarter as an educated bum. <laughs> I would be very well educated because I got a great education there. But I was equipped to do nothing. And that's when I sat down with my father and basically I said, what do you think I should do? He said, well, what do you want to do? And I, I was interested in Jewish education, being a teacher, uh, perhaps going further and being an educator. But your father didn't push you into this. My father never pushed me into it. The one thing he did was when I spoke about becoming an educator, a Jewish educator, he said, well, if you want to be a Jewish educator, you have to become an educated Jew first. And the way to do that, he said, is not to go to teacher's college, where you'll just learn to be a, an educational plumber. Mm -hmm. You'll learn the how and yeah. why of education, but you're not going to learn the subject. You should go to yeshiva, get smicha, not go into the pulpit rabbinate, but become an educator but you will be an educated Jew after you finish four or five years in yeshiva in Reitz. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, I didn't realize that I would have four of those years with Rav Salvechik, Sechat Tzadik Levracha, which is enough to educate anybody, sure. including me. Uh, but I'm curious if we, could, if we could almost shift a little bit. You know, you, you said you had some doubts, and eventually you kind of built this storied career in KJ and in Ramaz. I want to shift and, and talk a little bit, beginning with you and then with Josh, about, you know, you, you said you have reservations with the term dynasty, which I understand. Did you expect or did you encourage Josh to join the rabbinate and to kind of come into this path, given that you already had three generations? You had, so to speak, what in the Talmud says, a chazaka. So... Let's let's keep this going. I, 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 I would understand why a parent would want to, to see that. To the best of my knowledge, no. You'll have to ask him. But to the best of my knowledge, I wanted him to grow up as a Shomer Mitzvos, as an observant Jew, as a knowledgeable Jew, as a learned Jew. If he would decide to go into the rabbinate, wonderful. But I don't remember ever pushing him into the rabbinate, just as I don't remember my father mm -hmm. pushing me in any way into the rabbinate. So you're exactly right. Uh, I think memory is always like a funny thing, and I know with myself, my father's a doctor, and I don't think he never put any pressure on me as a doctor, but you grow up with a certain value system of what, what does it mean to make a contribution? And that definitely shaped me, even if my father never sat me down and said, to make a contribution, you have to cure cancer. But I think everybody in my family, you have a certain bar of what it means to have a contribution that is dignified, a dignified contribution. So I guess I'm curious with you, Josh, your memory, whether it was spoken or unspoken, you eventually did begin your career as the assistant following in your father's footsteps and in your grandfather's footsteps as like the assistant to the generation previously. 
what drove you to even begin your path that way? If again, let's grant some aspect to, of what your father's recollection is, there was never any explicit like this is what you have to do. So, so what pulled you in that direction? So I, I would say I, I agree that I don't think there was anything explicit that my father had done. I do think there was the the, the community that I was in that was explicit from them. Um, you know, there were, I, I do remember sort of my whole life, this sort of expectation, not only that I would behave a certain way as the rabbi's son or the principal's son, but that I would eventually become the rabbi of KJ. Do you have an earliest memory of when you realized, I am a Lookstein? I'm not, I'm not Josh. I, I am a Lookstein, which is, do, do you have early... I, I don't. I don't have a specific memory of that. And I think part of it is because I spent, I feel like I spent my, my youth years running away from it. So to the extent that I had a memory of it, I don't have that memory anymore. When you say run away from it, what, what do you literally mean? You, you were a little mischievous, a little rebellious? Yeah, yeah, mischievous. I, I, I was never, I never did anything terrible. But I also just used to say, I, I, I remember, I mean, I could, I sort of this like a line that I have because I said it so many times, that becoming a rabbi was the last thing on earth I wanted to do, ever. Yet. You became Yet, a rabbi. I became a rabbi. So, so I'm just curious, during that process, right? were you like, was there a voice whispering like, what are you, like, turn the car around? Like, what, why are you going through with this? No. I, and I'll tell you why no. Because I think until I was in it and my father's assistant rabbi, I assumed it would never happen. So I feel like the choices that I made... The choices that I made, sort of, each of them sort of, they, they happened. There was never a time I sat down and I said, okay, I am 18 years old. I am 20 years old. Here's, the, here's my path to becoming the assistant rabbi mm -hmm. um, at KJ and, and working at Ramaz. Um, the first person who ever explicitly told me <laughs> that I need to be a rabbi um, was um, Rav Bina in Hakoto. Okay. Where he basically sat me down in his kitchen and said, I'm going, like I do in general, I'm going to tell you something that nobody else will tell you. Uh -huh. You have to be a rabbi. You Subtlety have to, is not. Yes, is not, that's, that's not his, uh, yes. Um, even if he, I, pay, I paid him. <laughs> even, <laughs> even if he weren't Israeli, he would not have that. Yes. He would not have that subtlety. I, I, I learned for two years in Israel. Had you told me before I went to Israel that I would learn, I would say that for two years, I would have told you that you were crazy. And then I got to YU, and I went to Hask for the summer, and I, sure. I got um, the, all the NCSY people there were, you know, recruiting me to be in their region. I went into the upstate um, NCSY region, and then I, I went to Winnipeg on Counterpoint, and then I went to Australia on Counterpoint, and I sort of, I was just in this world, and I, I was loving it. I was loving the teaching, mm -hmm. and I was loving the cure of work, and... At a certain point, it sort of was obvious if you wanted to become all all of my mentors um, in in this: um, Michael Unterberg, um, Jonathan Miskin, uh, 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 Stephen Finkelstein, a whole bunch of people. All the guys were were going and were getting smicha. You're like, I can do this. So now. okay, I guess if I want to teach, I'll get smicha, and I got smicha, and. Then I finished Micha and I got a job in Stanford, Connecticut for a year. Oh, you didn't begin. I didn't begin in KJ. Okay. No, I sort of got lucky. I had been a I had been a, a, a rabbi for the Yom Narayim in uh, in Agudath Shalom in Stanford. Sure, beautiful. And they needed a, a rabbi to tide them over between rabbis. Mm -hmm. So I went there for four months, and then they never they didn't succeed in finding a rabbi. So I was there for a year. That was my first pulpit, and then I. Took a year off. I want to. I want to interrupt. Yeah. At the end of that year in Stanford, uh, which he was right out of yeshiva. Yeah. He went and to be straight the senior from rabbi. Smicha to becoming the successor to Rabbi Aaron Kranz, who was just retiring from Agudah Shalom. There was someone in between. Yeah. But okay. Okay. 
All I can say is we were invited for a kiddush at the end of uh, that year in Stanford. For the Shabbos. For Shabbos. Yes, Shabbos and Shul. And they did a toast and a roast (laughs) of Joshua Lookstein. I have never seen such love for a young rabbi in my life. But in the back of your head when you were there, was there a part of you saying, we're going to bring you up to the, to the big leagues? Well, we had already talked about him. And it was, they, would, they took him on for only a year. When was the first conversation, so to speak, that like, it's, I don't time, to, it's time to come home? I don't remember the conversation. What I remember is at a certain point, at a certain point towards the end of that year, I think. Your first year as... As, as a rabbi... I, I, I realized that as lo- if, I was, if I had come this far, I was going to try it out in KJ and Ramaz. Like I, I wasn't going to, it didn't make sense to get to become to be this, to close. Be this close and then not to at least see if, if this was the right thing for me. So, but again, like, so like if you think about it, what I tell people is sort of becoming a rabbi was. The last thing on earth I wanted to do, and then it sort of became the second to last thing on earth I wanted to do, and the third to last thing on earth I wanted yeah. to do, and it sort of climbed the ranks, but it sort of climbed the ranks from the back Correct. a little bit. And then I think the same thing sort of with KJ and Ramaz. It wasn't this, at that point, it wasn't this, oh my goodness, like this is what I want to do. It still was. I guess I'm here already. Uh, I'm yeah, close I, by. I got it. I, I, I have to try it. And I it's, can't slow, not it's like try a slow it. drift Correct. that pulls you out. So I'm curious. When did you begin? Do you remember what time of the year was your first year as a in KJ? In KJ, yeah, I started in um, I started in the uh, fall of uh, 1998. Before the Yom Ryan, before the, the High Yaman, Holidays. Correct. So I'm curious when he began. What was the first time, if ever, that you noticed this is not going to be sustainable? I never noticed that. He was adored by the congregation. They were crazy about him. Uh, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating. I think so many people in that shul felt he was coming home. This is where he grew up. Yeah. And look. Yeah. And he has always been a people person. Sure. Which is the I single just most. You, who I already feel like we're friends. <laughs> it's the single most important <laughs> uh, thing in the rabbinate to be a people sure. person and to love people and want to be with people. And he hit the ground running. Uh, and uh, he was very good at everything. So if I were to have asked you, if I were to take a time machine to 1998, pull you aside and say, how, how do you think your son Josh is? Do you think this is going to be long-term? Do you think he's going to be the next senior rabbi of KJ? What would your response have been? I, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, gosh. I felt he could really handle it. Has to grow, obviously, and get, get experience and so on. But he was, he was fabulous. And uh, in, in my perception, which turned out to be wrong... He loved it and was loved by the congregation. Sure. Uh, I think I was right about being loved by the congregation. Sure. Uh, his as love far as for his, it. As far as his love for it, that was a little more open to question, and I absolutely did not anticipate that. So, so let's... when I started, yeah. I just, I loved what I was doing. I used to fight with my father sometimes on... On things, and what would you how to do your father? Would you remember specifics? my father loved decorum, order, uh, kavod, beis uh-huh. the glory of the shul, uh, a lot of the formality. Not that he didn't have spiritual. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't paint you as a hippie, exactly. No, no, <laughs> no, no. But I, I was, I was, I was interested in informal stuff. Uh-huh. I was interested in, in you know. Cooling a little bit, gotcha. The place, gotcha. And we used to argue about that. And generally, my father, after arguing f- furiously, sure, would say, "All right, go try it out." And then, and 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 if it worked out, 
he was always very gracious and said, you know what? Call HaKavod, good. But he would be fighting, and, he, and, and it continued for the, my 23 years. But, it, have, ne- but it, never, it never caused a serious rift. No, no rift. No, You'd no have rift. a debate, so... Yeah, the- yeah, I mean, you know, I had to work around him sometimes and so on. We didn't... I, in his years in, in KJ, I never felt that at all. And I tried not to do what my father was doing with me and insist on a certain way to do it. There's a KJ way to do it. What you're, what you're thinking about is not KJ. To the best of my knowledge, I did not do it, and I also tried not to overwhelm him with a lot of work because I yeah. wanted him to love what he was doing. Yeah, uh, Start to build up. So I'm curious for you, you started in before the high holidays in 98. When did you first have that thought in the back of your head? And like, I'm trying to remember like in my own life, beginning something and realizing I'm not going to stick with it. This is not, I, I need an out. I think I felt it even during Smicha, like there was a time that I wanted to be a pulpit rabbi. And I think that during Smicha, like some fight or flight kicked in and was like, this is not for you. You're not going to be a pulpit rabbi. And, and then there were like years where I was like lost. I'm curious... You had a successful year in Connecticut. You just came home, so to speak. When did it first dawn on you, this is not sustainable? Um, early, early. I, I probably at the end of my first year. Year one. You made yeah. it through a full year. I think I made it through a full year. I don't exactly remember, but I think I made it through a full year. And... And really was questioning if I could maintain, if I could maintain it. Because what was, what was so either depleting or difficult? I Meaning you had a good year in Stanford. Yeah. W- what, what changed your vigor for Jewish education that at the end of that year, this, this tiny voice starts getting louder and louder and saying, this is not going to be a long-term path? So I think it was, it was a few things. I think number one, I was I was 28. At, I guess at the end of my first year, I was 29, and I was single. And I was I was working 24 mm-hmm. seven. Um, I mean, really 24 seven. I mean, and I sort of consider even just having to put on a suit Sunday morning to go to Minion. I always say I didn't become a pulpit rabbi, so I don't have to wear suits on Sunday. Right. So, you know, (laughs) like... That was the deal breaker for me. And that was... That that didn't even count, you know, all the the funerals and the weddings and the bar mitzvahs and the bar mitzvahs. But it was really 24-7. And, of course, Shabbos, when everybody else was winding down, I was was winding up. Sure. Um, And I just felt very much like I... I didn't have any. I didn't have a life, basically, mm-hmm. and dating was very hard. And it's hard not just. I, I, I was single when I entered into the Jewish educational sphere. To just blame it, though, it's a, a, a on the logistical factor of like, you're so busy. It's more than that. Yeah, it, it's hard being single, especially in the pulpit. It's hard being single in a being an educator. I struggle with that. It was even you know. I'm sure you had a workaround like. Yeah, having a talus you know i didn't have a talus because we waited until until we got married and like you would feel i always felt like a bucher in shul i didn't feel like a grown-up yeah yes um so i think number one i just felt like i was i was very overwhelmed in as much as my father really was trying very hard to make it as easy as possible and you noticed him doing that yeah i i, I knew what i i had heard the stories about how his the, you know, sort of how uh, often difficult it was with his, with uh, with my grandfather, and I, I was conscious. I was conscious that, of course, he was trying to make it easier for me. He wanted me to do this, and so at that point, clearly, he wanted me to do this, and so he was going to do as much as he could to to help me like it. It still didn't make it not overwhelming, and I think also I, I was doing a lot of teaching and. So I was teaching in, I was working in KJ and in Ramaz, and I was doing a lot of teaching, and I am not a huge Talmud Chacham, and preparing was very hard for me, mm-hmm. and so I just felt like I was, you know, it was even just hard for me, the, 
a bunch of things that were hard for me, but one of the things that was hard for me was like, there was no such thing as a night where I did not have to have several hours preparing for, sure. the, uh, for the next day. So I was very overwhelmed, but I, um, equally as important or maybe more important, I, I did not feel like it was my authentic self. Tell me about that. What do I, you mean by that? Because everything you've said would have applied equally in Stanford or in any pulpit. There was something about coming home, maybe a weight or something. W- what is it about your authentic self that you felt? Look, I, I, I'll answer, but I do want to say it was a lot more than Stanford. It was a, and I think part of the lot, lot more than Stanford was because of the expectation of the reputation that reputation the 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 model that my father had set and that my grandfather Oliver Shalom had set right there was you know we we we, we st- at one point in all of this sort of there was this like idea okay maybe maybe Josh can stay maybe he'll give him Tuesday off he, he's gonna be off on Tuesdays and I think my father looked at the person who said that and said what that's, that's, that's not a thing you don't get off on Tuesdays. that's not a thing you don't get off in, on Tuesdays the pulpit. right and and I think to a certain extent that was, you know, in, in Stanford, they had a wonderful tradition of, of the rabbinate, but I didn't know that tradition of the rabbinate. So I wasn't comparing myself to Rabbi Aaron Kranz, mm-hmm. I was, I was just 26 years old and doing Correct. what I needed Charting to do. your own path. Right. Whereas here, I, 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 they had, there's a certain expectation of what a rabbi did. And that was, so it was, it was more work gotcha. than, or I was working harder, let's, let's say and emotionally harder. In terms of being my authentic self, I don't know, I never really, I never, cons- I, I never considered myself, it's hard, it's hard to say as I went through smicha and I've been teaching, 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 I never considered myself a, a religious role model for people. And it was very hard for me to keep giving speeches and teaching and doing all these things about going to Minyan and I dreaded Minyan. <laughs> like I was not I was like and no I know what that is and, uh, you know I know to, what that is I heard once from Moish Bain and he was actually referring to KJ Moish Bain was the former president of the OU he always says I, I, I always wanted to be a pulpit rabbi the only pulpit I ever wanted was KJ he said that many times and he said he told me this and when he told to me it was like a knife in my heart because it resonated so much he said I could be a rabbi and I could command respect, but I would never be the kind of rabbi that I would respect because you know a little bit about yourself. And that, that, that a little piece of that still haunts me. I mean, I didn't go into the pulpit, so I don't feel like the example, you know, that pulpit rabbi example still weighs in the same way, but I know what that means. We're like, this doesn't come naturally to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm playing a role rather than exuding my natural self to the world. Yeah. So I, I that that was that was that was me. So let's let's move on past the whispers and let's just talk. Do you have a memory of the first time that Josh came to you and had what I would call the capital T capital C the conversation where he came to you and essentially said this is not working for me. Like, like that must be like, you, you know, you're looking through your eyes and you're saying, wow, it's all coming together. The rabbi is taking assistant just like I did, just like my father. Like, this is a wow moment. And at some point, the veil comes down, Josh approaches you and says this, and I know we're trying to avoid the D word, but this dynasty from an outsider would look at it. I know that, I, I know you don't like that term, but, but to an outsider, is not going to be continuing in the in this very natural trajectory that we're set up for. Yeah, I uh, the D word. I'm sorry. Uh, that, I know. No, 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 no. I uh, that that I never thought about the D word really. I thought about what this congregation needs, and I felt that. Uh, Josh was exactly what this congregation needs. Um, just as I felt it was my father that it needed. And I, I guess I was never that self-analytical to think about that I was what they needed. But I genuinely felt that he was, 
And, and this would be fantastic for the future. I'm not going to work forever. And I could turn it over to him. And he had all the values and, and attitudes and commitment um, that I thought was necessary, which is a total commitment. Sure. I think when he talks about 24-7, he's talking about, at that time... He wasn't ready to be totally committed to a community. That was huge commitment, especially not being married, not having a family of his own. Uh, but I didn't know this until so we what, had a conversation. When was the conversation? In, in, inside in the kitchen, around the kitchen table. What time of the year is this? I don't remember what time of the year. It was okay. just, it was a very. It was a perplexing day for me and, of course, very upsetting when he sat across the table from me with his mother sitting kind of next to me. Uh, did, you, the, did you prep your mother beforehand? Sometimes dynamics. He, did she know what this conversation was about? He, my father's leaving. He's leaving one part of the story out. It, it, it wasn't, I don't think it was exactly that I said, M- uh, Mom, Dad, I want, I, I'd, I'd love to sit with you and talk to you about my future. He's no. sort of it leaving. It was not that. No, it, it, it's funny. I actually even forgot that part. Do you want to set up the me, context? Yeah, I'll set I want to hear his, your father's yeah. recollection. Definitely. Yeah. I'll set up the context. The context was, um, it was, when it, is this? It, this was, um, I'll, I think this conversation happened the week um, it was uh, Aseris Mechuva. Okay. Right after Russia. Right Shana. after Russia Shana. Right after um, 9/11. Okay, that's a. It was the, that's a big Russia Shana. Yeah, I remember it that was, year. It was my, my brother's fourth, bar mitzvah. Yeah. It was my fourth year, and I had, and 9/11 happened, and rabbis everywhere had to rewrite their. This their, is four years in. This is four years in. Okay. This is my fourth Russia Shana. Okay. So it was, um, 2001. Okay. And everyone had to rewrite their, their sure. drushes and I, I did it and I gave what people said was an absolutely amazing, outstanding um, drusha, which subsequently, I don't know, 20, 10 years later, I looked at just to... I was about just, to ask you, you still have I, it? I still have it. I looked at it just to to have a moment of pride, and I read it, and I thought, oh, this doesn't make any sense. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't, <laughs> this doesn't uh, make okay. any sense. This doesn't follow point one to point okay. two. <laughs> anyway, um, I think, again, like this is a whole separate thing. People needed, sure. people needed to hear something. They heard something, and okay. But it was in- unbelievably draining. It was an unbelievably draining Rosh Hashanah and for everybody, but for a rabbi, I think, specifically. Sure. Um, other than victims' families, but sort of to, to people who sort of lead people, um, and it was it was um, mostly uh, all the, towards the end of, of the second day of Rosh Hashanah. I, all I was thinking was, um, I just want to fin- I want to go home and I want to get into bed after Yontif and I want to tur- put the, pull the covers up and turn the TV on and watch for three hours. And Speaking that's, my language, that's really all I wanted to do. And I'm so so. Yantif ends, and I'm in my office, and I'm taking off my talus, take off my kitzel, take off my towel, whatever it was, my talus. I guess at that point, whatever I was putting away my yeah. stuff, and my father comes in. There's a little bit actually something interesting about this also now. My father comes in, and he says to me, um, "A friend of so and so, who is a member of the shul, who I randomly saw last week." For the first time in many, many years, the, the, a friend of a member of the shul passed away, and they have nobody to do the funeral, and I can't do it because of such and such, um, so here's their, here's their address. They're, they're, they're waiting for you in their apartment. And I, I can still feel like the wind. I can it. still feel exactly. I can still feel the wind being knocked out of me, and I can still feel the. And I lost it. 
and I don't really, if you ask me how many times I've lost it in my life. When you life, say lose it, what, what do you, you got angry, you I got, got sad. I you got, got, like in the moment I got angry and I walked out on my way and then I came, like just, I think a little bit like in the movies, maybe I was being overly dramatic. Yeah. I, I, I walked out of the office and then I marched right back into the office, into his office. And I said to him, um, I wish I could be the kind of rabbi who, when they find out that someone passes away after after Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, Hashanah 9/11, um, ready to serve, is, like yeah, a and says, you know, but you know, Baruch Dayan Ha'emet, how you know, where, where, how Give can I be helped? Exactly, how can I be helpful? But I can't. I'm not. That That's kind not of... me. I can't do it. And. And I left, and I did. I, I obviously went. Did you to, end up doing the? Yeah, line? of course I. Yeah, of course I ended up doing the funeral. Sure. I was not saying I won't do this, but it was it was more of a. I can't. I I can't. I can't, I can't this. sustain this. I just yeah. can't sustain this now. I, yeah. And this is before the conversation that your father's describing. Yeah. So th- oh. this ba- then I believe one of us said to the other, "We need to sit down. We need to sit down and, and talk." Okay, so you, now... You probably said it. <laughs> so, so take me back. Now, now you sit down, because I want to hear this through your eyes. So much is going well. Do you recall the, the post-Rosh Hashanah conversation? I don't recall that it was post-Rosh Hashanah. Okay. I recall a conversation at the kitchen table. Okay. Uh, with in, your in, wife? With, with, with right, your with his mother. Okay. I was sitting at the whatever the head of the kitchen table is opposite the back door. He was sitting at the other head of the table or the foot of the table. And my wife was sitting uh, alongside the length it's of like the, the Camp it's, David Accords. It's a, it's, a, it's a small table. It's yeah. not a big table. It, it, it basically is made for four people that could accommodate <laughs> six. And he uh, told me in his own... Uh, <laughs> Uh, fashion I don't like this job Uh, I want out you know and in effect I I can't really continue this Um, and I was stunned you were stunned you were surprised I I was stunned yeah I didn't know what was going on in his head at all but I was, I was stunned. Would you use the word disappointed? Like what, what? I think, I think, I think my wife was disappointed. I don't remember the feeling of disappointment. I, I was just stunned. I didn't understand it. What do you mean you don't like this job? This is a hard job. I know what twenty four seven is. That's the way I've I've worked. Uh, and I know what pressure is, and I can't say that I love pressure. I don't love pressure, but I respond to pressure. And when there's a need to do things, I'll do them. But I've never really thought about, do I like this or do I not like this? That was not, this is, this is my, my role, my profession, my life. And the congregation is my family. And uh, at this stage in, in uh, my son's life, he was still looking at it as a, as a job. Sure. Am I stating it? Uh, yeah, yes. I mean, you also understood yes. it's, a, it's a role, it's a calling, it's a mission. And yeah, so on. I, I think it's important just to, we don't have to follow this, but I, I, I think it's important to, to say a couple of things. Just number Please. one, I did feel very fulfilled. Sure. Like I've, I've, I know when I'm fulfilled and when I'm not, and I've had jobs that have fulfilled me and jobs that have not fulfilled me. So I've, I, I was very fulfilled. It was very meaningful. I loved the relationships. Um, I loved the connections. I, I did enjoy the Ramaz part of it more than I enjoyed the KJ part of it. So there was, there was a lot good. It just was not sustainable. Uh-huh. For the reasons we talked yeah. about. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it was somehow overwhelming. 
It sounds like almost you wanted it to be more of a job, meaning it was such a calling, it was so enveloping of your identity, it didn't end ever. If it were a job, it may have been more sustainable. If it would have been, you know, nine to five, nine to eight, Sundays off, but you, you don't have that kind of calendar when you're a pulpit rabbi. You don't get to, like, block off. So your your first reaction after this conversation, I'm curious, was there was it like, you know, there are different stages of grief that they talk about. So one of the stages is bargaining. So was that when you started with the Tuesday bargain? Like maybe we can all may, maybe we can make the job palatable. No. That... I I think what I asked for in that meeting or it soon after was I asked for a year. I asked for a break. I asked for like for a like leave a sabbatical of, for a leave of absence basically. Sure. I basically was saying if I I feel like may, let me leave and spend some time doing something else. In your head, did you plan on coming back after that leave of absence initially? I thought it was a long shot, but I thought it was the only shot. It was the only shot. And is that how it began? Did you did it initially begin as a leave of absence? Yeah. That was an interesting thing too. I had, <laughs> I don't know if it was that conversation or another one, but I had somehow gotten into my head that I wanted to go to the London School of Economics. Don't ask me. I have no recollection of why. Okay. That's what I wanted to do. And my father said, eventually my father said, you, you, that, that's not going to fly. Okay. The school's not going to give you a leave of absence to go to London School of Economics. You want a leave of absence, go to Israel and learn. And I said, I don't want to go to Israel and learn because going to Israel and learn is not going to be enough of getting out of this milieu yeah. for me to really sort of experience something else and decide, you know, sort of choose. Sure. I guess sort of it was, I guess to me I had, I, I guess, and I'm thinking about this actually now somewhat for the first time, in light of sort of the way I described how I got there to begin with, it wasn't, I was looking for this to be a, my choice rather sure. than for me to, do it because things have just led there. You wanted to step underneath the mountain. You didn't want the mountain held on top of you, yeah. which a lot of times. So, I'm, what did you end up doing with your leave of absence? Um, I went. Did you? I went to Israel, and it didn't happen so quickly. And it, it didn't happen so quickly. Um, we owe, it probably the, happened at the end of the year. Yeah, it happened towards the end of the year. So you had the kind of the duration of the year where you knew, you both knew that he was taking a leave of absence. Did you? Did no. you? I wasn't ta I wasn't taking the leave. I, I don't a hundred percent remember, but I I wasn't taking the leave unless the leave was. The, my only choice was Israel, and then actually I think my father at a certain point said, it's, "Now it's too late. It's mm -hmm. too late." Sort of towards the end of the year, you can't sort of come to me now and say, "Okay, you'll go to Israel," because now who are we going to find next year? And I think there was. Do you remember this? Um, no. Nope. Um, um, Rabbanit Chana Henkin. Sure. Um, who I have a relationship with and who um, my father, my family has a relationship with. Um, they, they saw each other somewhere and my father came back from that conversation and said, if you want to go to Israel for the year, you can go to Israel for the year. She, it was June. She prevailed, you think? She um, prevailed. She prevailed. I think she said to my father, Azal. And she knows about... Yeah, and she also promised to find to you find, a wife. Right. That's, that's another <laughs> great... Sweeten the deal. That's Sweeten a great story. That's, that's another great story Sweeten at some the point. Pot. But that's right. basically it was June, and, and my father said, okay, if you want to do this, you can do this. So, and the congregation was crushed. So when did you announce it to the con congregation? I do not remember. Did you delay it? Like no, 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 no. We didn't delay it. We, I mean, if, if this if this was basically signed, sealed, and delivered in June or in May or whatever it was, I don't remember it being June. I think that's a little bit late. Mm -hmm. We let the congregation know, and they were stunned, and they stunned were all over. Oh again. my goodness! Oh my goodness! And I'm curious for you. You know, every parent, it's we love sharing nachas, and it's always hard to share when you depart from the narrative you know uh, a child we love sharing our child starts medical school nobody likes sharing that my child took a leave of absence from medical school it's a, it's not the stories we like to share so i'm curious d did you have any element of embarrassment sharing no. it with others that this was not working out as people planned i don't remember but i i think after my conversation with rabbanit hankin which i frankly did not remember until uh, Josh just brought it up, but now I do remember. 
Do you remember what she compass- told you? Was it something? I don't remember exactly what she told me, but in a, in effect, I spoke to a couple of people about it. But she, she said, "Look, he needs he needs a year away. He may he may come back and he may not come back, but he needs a year away, and uh, we'll take care of him in Israel. And I'll find him a, a wife, because I'm sure that that was." An element in this whole sure. uh, thing. Being single. But very hard to be single. And he spent four years, very successful years. Uh, people thrilled with him. But he was alone. And uh, uh, she said, you know, we'll solve that Whatever it was, two for one. He'll and find I, himself I, at home. I did. Frankly, I did not expect him to return. You did not. No, I did not. Did you know that? That did you have that feeling from him as well? That this is kind of no. So you 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 continued appearances, even though in the back of your head. You, this is the only. If there's going to be a way, this is the only way. But you never outwardly spoke. This is. I'm, pro- I'm not coming back at the end of this year. So. So if you mind fast forwarding, just because it, it, it really is gripping, and I know, look, not most of our listeners are not part of a intergenerational rabbinic world, but I do believe, particularly in the American Jewish community, definitely in the American Orthodox community, families really do struggle with this notion in the business world, where there is a family business that's been passed down, and it can lead to these all the tensions that emerge from expectations. So I'm curious... During this leave of absence, did it take you long? Was it like an epiphany, like, I'm not coming back? Was that like a whole nother conversation? Did you have to like kind of revisit the wound? Or it was just like, now that I'm out of it, like it was so obvious and clear. No, I, we, we, I think we revisited it. Again, I'm not sure that my father would remember it exactly this way. But for me, it was very, it was a powerful moment. Yeah, I definitely feel like I was, I really enjoyed the first few months of that year. It was, it was, it was, it was important. It was a, it was a very, it was very helpful few months. My parents came for, um, thank, around Thanksgiving time. To Israel. To Israel. And I don't remember exactly. I, I was at, I was at Hebrew U on a, on a uh, program at the, at the Mendel Center. Mm-hmm. And Mandel Institute, and I it was it, it was it was it was a very nice program. It was not so demanding, and I was doing whatever I you know I was doing a lot of I spent a lot of time on my own and just sort of doing what I wanted to do and gaining from the program, and my and my I spoke to my father after we, my, we had a conversation after he got back to New York. And he said, he wasn't. Ha- I think he wasn't happy with how I was spending my time. Mm-hmm. And he said, he said, he said something that he had said to me many times before in different ways, throughout my throughout my my life to that point, yeah. which was, you need to you need to buckle down, you need to go to Huck Hotel, you need to learn. You need to do this, 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 and this. Fully step into it. Fully, yeah. You got. If you're you're gonna be there, you gotta you gotta learn. You have to do this. You have to sit. You have to, and so on. And I think to me that was the moment because because it was it was sort of the same message I had been getting, and it was a message that 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 I that I had never. I think at that point I realized it's not that I'm. It's not that I don't want to do it. It's that it's not me. Mm-hmm. And the thought of now sitting in the base medrash and learning, to and learning into that box, right, exactly, and push and exactly. Hammer. I it, it wasn't going to be. And so I came home a couple of days later. Um, I came home midway from, through this sabbatical. Oh yeah, I actually came home a bunch of times that year, but I came home a few days after this conversation. I do remember having a conversation with my mother, not my father afterwards, and telling my mother how I felt after that conversation. And then I came home and 
we there's a little there's a, a little bit in between, but base in effect, basically, I came home and I met with my parents in their in the in my father's office, and I said I'd made the decision. You're not coming um, back, and I'm I'm not I'm not coming back. This was this was no this was the end of November, basically the beginning of December. Was that hard for you to share with them? Oh my God, it was impossible. I mean, we 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 were we were all cry- all three of us for were real? crying. It was it was emotional that that room. It was horrible. It was horrible. Do you, do you have recollections of that meeting? Interestingly, no. But his sisters were also very upset. <laughs> it was like the whole family <laughs> yeah. was looking I, towards you. I remember you. that. I remember Mindy, Debbie, and Shira, who were all already married and, uh, you know, uh, had families. They were They were very... But, you know, we, we came to terms with it quickly. I mean, if that's what, if, if he doesn't feel like he wants to continue, then he shouldn't continue. He has to be himself. And you, you can't be in the rabbinate and dislike it. I think you can be a lawyer and dislike it. I suspect you can be a doctor and dislike it. I'm pretty sure you can be a businessman and dislike it. But I don't think you can be a rabbi and dislike it. And at that point in his life, he disliked it. I'm curious, when it kind of the dust settles, and I'm curious from each of you to really hear this, you know, I, I always reflect on this notion of alternative history that there's like an alternative timeline. What if, what if I, you know, lived in a different community, married a different spouse, had a different profession? Like we all have these what ifs that hover over us. Most of our what ifs, you know, a handful of people know. You have and live with a what if, with an alternative timeline that the whole world knows where you started on this path that was like very obvious. And I'm curious if after leaving, did the whispers disappear? Meaning, did did you then had to build a career from scratch? But but it's never fully from scratch because you still have the last name, you still have the experiences, you still have the connections. And I'm curious for you in all those years, like were you able? Did the whispers just stop existing? Did you make peace with a certain level? Like oh, that's that's Josh Luxstein, you know he. And, and then like, you see the hand motion. Even if you don't overhear what they're saying, he was going to be in the... You know, like, d- did you still have to live with that whisper, knowing that when you walk out of the room, they're sharing your biography for you and that alternative history? I... I wasn't... Um, I guess the answer is yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. It, it must have been. It's not my dominant memory from that time i actually went when the eventually when the when the letter went to the to the congregation it didn't go until march and when the letter went to the congregation i received and i i wonder if i have them somewhere i don't know but i received many letters from congregants telling me how telling me how courageous I, I, they thought I was and how strong I was. I, I think they were the people who also wanted me to stay. But I, I mean, these people knew me. Obviously, there was a major thing that I was keeping from them, but, yeah. but they, they knew me since I'm, since I'm a child. And so, you know, there was a real, and, and since then, Probably the dominant thing that I remember is people saying to me, "Oh my good, oh my goodness, it, you know, oh you're Josh Lickstein. Wow, you know, it must have taken so much. You have so much courage to do what you did." And I, my my response is always not always. It depends who it is, but my response often is, "It didn't take courage. I was miserable." But like, but, I was, but why why why? What emotional core does that hit when you think of those letters? I could imagine. Did that make you feel like, oh, they've been rooting for me all along? Did it? Did it make me? Oh, I'm disappointing them. Why does that strike such a chord with you? 
It's so um, moving that they did that. I hope you save those letters. I would love to to have one or two to to read because that's the most moving way that you could ever hope a congregation would react. But I see clearly it, it evokes something in you. I'm curious what what's that touching upon. I mean, I guess it's your, based on your question. You know, the the Bishul could have gone one of two ways, right? They could have been furious, mm-hmm. and they could have felt abandoned, and they could have felt. Taken, take yeah. Which maybe maybe people did, and maybe even these people did. But it wasn't the strong. It wasn't there. But what they chose to communicate to me was that they that they wished me well, and that they they're proud of you. That, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know about these letters. I'm not surprised at all. Uh, I'm not surprised at 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 this. To me, it's a, a revelation because I've never seen any of those letters. Uh, but I know that it did take a lot of courage on his part to to do this because. Did you ever uh, express that to him? Were, were there ever a time? Again, I'm curious for you. You have an alternative timeline too. Every time that you look, who I happen to know, the sitting rabbi of KJ is a wonderful person, a friend. But I don't. I don't think. Of, I don't think of that at all. I don't. I don't. You never think, I don't say, compare. It could have been. Oh my God. No. Josh would have been so much. No, I don't think that way. Not that he would have been better, but this would have looked different. This would have been a. Con- no. No, I. I. I don't. I and don't. did you ever express? Do you feel like you expressed enough, you know, like what he went through and like give him that? I think I did uh, at one point. I came to terms with his feelings. Absolutely came to terms with his feelings. And I respected the fact that if he feels the way he feels, that this was an absolutely overwhelming uh, kind of responsibility, which he didn't like. Uh, and uh, uh, that although his public performance was outstanding, despite what he says, he looked at that sermon after the <laughs> the nine eleven uh, sermon nine eleven and <laughs> said, I, "I don't understand what what I said." Uh, his public performance in situations like that and in funerals. And in uh, weddings, was so good that I used some of them in my homiletics sure. seminar at Yeshiva as examples of how to build a eulogy. But I'm I remember ki- one in particular, one in particular for somebody who died just before Pesach. And it's complicated why I didn't do it, and he did it, and I heard from Israel how incredible he was, and I asked him to give me the copy of that eulogy, and I read it, and I all I could say is I wished I could have composed such a eulogy. But, uh, but yeah. despite that, you know, if if deep inside this is not what he wanted to do then he had to make the decision that he made i'm just curious and and we're going to wrap up soon because i know i want to be mindful of the time but i'm curious for you as a father was it difficult to express not i know you were so proud of him when those years when he was in the pulpit was it ever hard to feel and or express pride in your son after he left because he's it was not difficult. No. Uh, just just to unpack uh, that question, meaning because he's doing uh, something, it's adjacent, but it's not kind of it. It's not the... I was thrilled when Westchester Day School came to UJA, where he was raising money professionally, and somebody thought out of the box mm-hmm. and came to him, and he was interested in it. And I, I could not be more proud of the fact that he returned to Jewish education, which was his greatest love. And as far as I'm concerned, he did rabbinic work there, 
He talks about 24-7. At Westchester Day School, he spoke at virtually every bar mitzvah sure. party and every mm-hmm. bat mitzvah party. And I heard some of the presentations and they were phenomenal. And I couldn't be prouder. And you know, now, now that he's back in Ramaz, I'm absolutely, absolutely thrilled. And as far as I'm concerned, okay, I mean, when people say, oh, someday we'll have him back in KJ, I say, oh, no, that's not what he wants to do. He wants to run a school, and he wants to lead a, an educational institution. And first of all, nobody can do both anymore. Both that's places are too big. And, but that's what he really wants to do. And he works very, very hard uh, at that job and that uh, mission. So, uh, And for you, did, did you, I mean, it's very moving and beautiful. Did you feel, was it hard for you to share your successes after leaving with your, with your parents? So I, I, I feel like this is important to say. I think I don't think anybody who knows us would would be surprised to hear that the 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 your question about sort of the whispers of the congregation and my response about the people who wrote that was wonderful but there was really only one person that I was concerned about and that what what he thought um and to a certain extent my my you know what my mother, mother sure thought. um and I actually think that one of my that one of my father's strengths and what makes him who he is is that he even at age ninety one he my father never stops learning. I mean, you sort of saw sure, the books I when you walked in. He had you, books open. It was right, very beautiful. He to never see. stops sure. learning. And I just had this conversation the other day with with somebody about how he he never stops learning. And I do think that when I initially one thing that sort of troubled me. When I init- in that meeting in my father's office, when I told them officially, my parents, my father had had it. My father hugged me, and he said, "the the the community is going to be so." I forget what it was, but, you know, devastated, disappointed, sad, whatever. Um, it is going to be so so disappointed, and I thought to myself, "Oh, like that's not what I want to hear right now." I, I want to. I want to hear me. I, I want to hear yeah. him thinking about me yeah. and not the community. But number one, my father's all about the community. Sure. <laughs> Twenty really, really about that. But that's not what I wanted to hear then. But I feel like over the you know next eight years, when I was all over the place sure. and really, it wasn't even adjacent. It was doing something else yeah. and finding myself in a lot of ways. I actually feel like over that time. He he got it. He somehow fully. You he, felt he that. Got it. Yeah, I felt he got it fully. I felt that it was really what he just said now, which is what he remembers, which is that it was about my feelings, and and he he got it. Like he got that I had to be doing what I wanted to do and what I felt was authentic and what I what I what I thought. And to to amazing to amazing degrees that I won't go in. Go, won't go in, but it had to do with my dating life and who I dated and who he supported me dating, whether he thought it was a good idea or not. It was very much his, his, he, it was a shift. It was, and he was, I don't know how old you were, you were, you were your late seventies. And it was very much like, if this is what you want, this is, then I will support you in, in this. And you felt that fully. I think it's part of why this story. It took a long time for my children to raise me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what makes the story so moving that, you know, a figure in a family that is so synonymous with institutions to be able to kind of come down to the hyper local and focus on the ultimate institution, namely family, um, is really like an example, I think, to the Jewish world and everything that you represent within those institutions, I think, benefit from that love and care and empathy that you've showed uh, for one another. I personally find it deeply moving and really consider it a privilege to even speak with you on this. Um, 
I always end my interviews with more rapid fire questions. Uh, and I'm curious uh, if there are any uh, books or specific pieces of advice that you would give to families who are navigating these kind of religious differences, uh, whether it's religious, professional, uh, families deal with these differences and you have to build capacity to do it. I'm curious if there are any specific books, ideas, or advice that stand out to you during this period that, uh, that, you, would, that you would share with, with another family who's, who's navigating this in whatever way in their own lives. Well, we certainly talk a lot about uh, children who, as they grow into adulthood go off the derech sure. uh, and veer away from the values of the family and uh, in all kinds of ways. Sure. And in today's world of uh, choice, the choices can be immense uh, and very, very varied. Uh, my advice to people is don't forget to love your child no matter which path your child takes, uh, whether it's identity or religion or preferences and so on and so forth. Don't forget to first love and your child. First and foremost, uh, remember that uh, this person is your child and to be as supportive and loving of your child as you possibly can. Even if the choices uh, it doesn't really apply so much here. Sure. Uh, but even if the choices are very different from the ones that you would have liked uh, the child to take. Josh, I'm curious for you if you have any specific books, advice, for specifically like that guided you through this. Is there anything, there's a moment that you remember giving you strength or encouragement through a book, even a movie, honestly, that gave you capacity that like stands out during this period of charting your own path? Because um, it is almost a movie. It feels, there's something very biblical about. Now you're getting yeah. back to dynasties again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a TV show. Um, I don't, I don't, it, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of That's a specific fine. book or movie. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know, I, Guess I, I, one word, I wasn't going to go with this. One word Please. I was going to think I was going to say was about redemption. So to the extent that Shawshank Redemption sort of is somehow connected or there's something to learn from that. But I... Is that um, the word that jumps out at you? It, it you was the word that, that came, when I was, my father was, was giving his answer, I would say that, yeah, I, 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 I believe that, I just believe in... The power, as I start, two things come up. The believe in the power of people to continue sort of becoming, mm -hmm. and and that you know, like like the the like the Rev said, it's not about it's not about why, but it's about what now, and mm -hmm. that there's sort of always a what now after yeah. something happens. So I think that's something that that um that I think about, but I also. Uh, so I know you asked for one. I have like so many things. Um, I would say a second thing would be we, we do whatever we can with our children or our friends or our loved ones in general. And then once a person makes a decision, I believe in honoring that person's decision f fully and, and being able to, to stop on a dime, basically. And, and, and pivot um, yeah. to a certain extent. You never know what's going to be, but not pivot because the person is going to, because maybe the person will come back or maybe the person will, will but pivot like because... Like a carrot, like come back. Yeah. Right, exactly. But pivot because, stop on a dime because that's what the other person needs. To honor and, that person. Yeah, you can't, for, you know, you, it doesn't work to, to force. And I guess the third thing I would say, sorry that you asked for one, but the third no, thing please. I would say, and it's not a book and it's not a movie, is to give people time. Time, becoming. <laughs> I love what time. you began with. I think there's something very 
you know, we we have four languages for redemption. The Dal Lashonos of Geula. It's not a, that binary, but it's part of the redemptive process. Is a process in of itself, and I think that you've really modeled that. And the fact that you're kind of returning home now after this long leg and back in Ramaz, I think really encapsulates that. I'm always curious about people's other academic interests. If somebody gave you a great deal of money and allowed you to take a sabbatical with no responsibilities whatsoever to go back to school and get a PhD in any topic of your choice, what do you think you would study? Psychology. Like, is there an area? Psychology. PhD in psychology. Josh. Same, same exact answer. Psychology. psychology. Behind psychology. any great rabbi is a is a yeah, great because I I always tell people that in counseling, I reach my level. I know when I reach my level of incompetence, mm-hmm. and I reach it pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I refer the person to somebody yes, who is a specialist for sure, and not take the role on of, of specialist term therapist uh, that I don't uh, yes. have. My, my last question, I'm always curious about people's uh, sleep schedules. We mentioned this is a 24-7 job. What time do you go to sleep at night? Oh, yeah. What time do you go to sleep at night, and what time do you wake up in the morning? <laughs> well, having just read a book called Why We, we sleep, sleep, Yes. <laughs> I try very hard to go to sleep at 1030 at night and be up essentially at 6.30 in the morning in order to get to Minion. But in the real world, that doesn't happen very often. Uh Uh-huh, it's usually a little bit later. I I can't get into that. When I read the book, Why We Sleep, and he says, every human being essentially needs eight hours of sleep. First of all, I know that I need nine. (laughs) <laughs> but he says he says eight, and if you don't get eight hours of sleep, he has a whole series of chapters of the terrible things that can happen to you, from from memory to function to sure. psychology to and cancer and everything. And I think to myself, I'm 91 years old. The times that I got eight hours of sleep are pretty. Few. You've managed. What in heaven's name am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> or am I the exception the to the rule? Okay, that's fair. Rib uh, Josh, what time do you go to sleep at night? What time do you wake up in the morning? It's easier to say what time I wake up. I wake up at about a quarter after five in the morning. Oh, wow. Um, I did not see you being an early riser. Nor did I, but about six months ago, I jumped into Dafyomi, and okay. that's when I do it. And it's, I feel like it's been game-changing. Wow. And I one of the reasons it's been game-changing is because I real, I've now discovered I could be up and functioning and at a quarter after five. And what time do you go to sleep? And I, I, I like to try to go to sleep by 11, but it's not, it doesn't happen that often. Rabbi Lookstein, my friend Josh, I cannot thank you enough for inviting me into your home, sharing me this part of your lives, this conversation. This has been an absolute privilege and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.